Okay, welcome back. Now, if you're watching this, I can only assume you're in honors because these problems that introduce a phase shift, they're only done by either honors teachers or like the meanest regular teachers in the world. I'm not sure I've ever even seen one. I mean, these are really rough. So the problem is that even though it's easy to talk about what the phase shift is, it actually adds a whole nother level of complexity to the problems in terms of execution. We already had a five step process to graph these things. All this is going to do is add a sixth step, a new y-axis, and shift things sideways. But the problem is that once you do that, the second step where we divide everything up into like halves and half again, we have to label our axes. That just because it becomes a time-consuming mess, just because there's so many fractions involved and they all have pi in them. So if you're not like super happy with fractions and fractions with pi on top of them, then that's where this becomes a nightmare. But if you're an honors, you know you can probably figure it out. So I'll work through some, and you'll see how I do it, and then maybe that'll help you figure out how to do it too, and not make a lot of mistakes. But you know, teachers usually won't crucify you if you just mess up a little bit, you know, on a fraction here or there. So you'll get it mostly right if you follow the steps and don't make too many mistakes. All right, so what is the phase shift? We mentioned the introductory video to this chapter that the phase shift is like a sideways shift. So if you look up here, we've got a regular sine graph. Down here, we have one that's been shifted to the right. Now, and this is the number we're looking for. There, if there's a number in parentheses along with the theta. So the theta is stuck, sort of trapped in a set of parentheses with another number. That's when we have a phase shift that's going to shift us sideways. Just like in Algebra 2, that was a good tip, was that if you're, if you're going to have an X transformation or like a shift, that's going to be when a number is trapped in a set of parentheses with the X variable. So same thing, theta gets trapped. Our horizontal shift is C. So that means that this coordinate here, instead of being instead of sine starting at zero as it usually does, it's going to start at c instead. Now there's some special rules for that that we'll get into in later examples, because you'll see it different ways. But the point is that this distance here that we just moved things, that's called the phase shift. So that's what we got to really carefully figure out as one of the early steps in these problems. And I want to point out, as I will many times, a negative sign actually means a right shift. So that kind of goes back to some stuff in Algebra 2 where neg a negative next to the x is actually a right shift, not a left shift. It's kind of opposite what you expect, but if you get used to it, it's not too bad. All right. Basic example, here we go. So the new, the new step we're going to add to our process is a new y-axis. So just like a vertical shift caused us to move things up or down, and we'll get to some of those later that have both that and this, the, the element or the step that this phase shift is going to add to our process is to put a new y-axis. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what our c is. It's usually pretty easy to spot. It's right here. That, and in this case, it's pi over 2. And since there's a negative sign built in, that means it's a right shift of pi over 2. So what I have to do is just drop in a pi over 2. And literally, what I do is I just draw a new y-axis, and I'm going to kind of pretend that that's my y-axis from now on. All right, so now we're into the steps from the previous section, the previous video, which was come up with a new y-axis first, a new x-axis based on a vertical shift. You'll notice there is nothing out here behind the parentheses. There's like an imaginary plus zero. So we're in luck. On this one, it's a little bit simpler that we can just use the same old x-axis we've always had. All right, the next steps in our process involved finding the, the uh, period length and then dividing that into fourths and labeling our axes. So this is still the same as it used to be. We're going to do 2 pi over b. Now b in this case, the number that theta is multiplied by, nothing, right? So there's imaginary 1 there. So that's just going to be 2 pi. So I just go and draw 2 pi on the axis, right? No, can't do that, not so fast. Because what, that, what the period is, is that's the the time it's going to take a sine to go start at zero, go up, and then down, and then back to zero again. That's two pi. It's two pi long. But I'm not starting at zero anymore. I'm starting at pi over two. So that means my endpoint's not going to be two pi. It's going to be two pi plus pi over two. What's two pi plus pi over two? Sports fans, anyone? Five pi over two. Not crazy bad, but if you can't do it in your head or even hesitant to, you know, just write it down as a fraction problem, common denominators and all that kind of stuff. Now, it gets uglier still because now we have to divide things into fourths, right? 
So I need to find a point that's halfway between 5 pi over 2 and pi over 2. So how do I find that? I just add them together and I divide by 2. It's kind of like taking the average of the two x coordinates. Set and divide by 2, so that's going to be 6 pi over 2. Since we're